all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Father, we could just echo uh, an amen to that text and to these songs. We love the promise of your provision for us, and we desire to know more deeply what you would speak to us uh, in this scripture. And we thank you so much for the gift of a good pastor like Pastor Carl, who labors to give us your word um, in abundant clarity and depth. Would you please bless him as he speaks and give him clarity of thought? And even would your Holy Spirit guide him uh, to speak just what you'd have him to in this moment uh, as you ordain or uh, adorn all the, the preparation that he's done? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't have my Bible. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, music team, and great to worship uh, with each and every one of you here uh, this morning. I, I had a, uh, I, I don't know if it was a privilege or a punishment. Uh, as I mentioned here uh, this morning, I was up kind of late uh, and working. Uh, Friday and, and then up late last night in preparation to to fill in for Nathan. Uh, he conveniently is 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 preaching up in uh, uh, Hewlett, Wyoming this morning, and then he didn't want to get off track in his Daniel series, so he asked me to teach the most debated and difficult uh, difficult prophecy found in Daniel. Uh, this morning. And so, brother, I know you're not listening, but maybe you'll uh, listen to this sermon. I just want to tell you, thank you so much. That was, that was really, uh, really fun. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I think I confused more people than I helped, but uh, we, we got through, we got, we got through some notes. <laughs> well, if you're here uh, this morning, I want to welcome you um, and, and then maybe invite you uh, to take a, uh, uh, yourself back to the first century Judaism. And if we did that, we would find a prevailing thought that surrounded uh, a person's wealth, a person's wealth. And as you have already heard, we're, we're following up here on, on, on what to do with, with wealth and, and these things, as, as Rex has already read. And that prevailing thought that was going on in the time of uh, of Jesus is if someone happened to be wealthy, it was a sign that they had favor uh, or the favor of God on their lives. And it's why so often the, the disciples struggled so much when, when Jesus would challenge them about wealth. And you might remember the rich young ruler and, and how, uh, uh, how uh, Christ essentially had to say, uh, you know, Here's a guy who went away weeping because he had his wealth. He, did, he, he chose not to follow uh, the Lord at that period of time. And, and, and so in summation, he looks at his disciples and he, and he tells them this verse that we're very familiar with, right? That it's, it's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than for a what? Camel to go through the eye of a needle. Well, that's causing his disciples just a lot of internal distress because in their lives they, uh, they had attached wealth to God's blessing. And therefore, if you were wealthy, you, God was blessing you. And so that was kind of the Jewish uh, idea of, of wealth. But what happened when a Jewish person's idea of wealth and favor was challenged and an ungodly individual was wealthy? Was it because God had made that ungodly person wealthy? And was their wealth really a good measure of their eternal destination? Asaph, the psalmist, pondered these questions of the wealthy on earth in Psalm 73. He started the psalm saying, Surely God is good to Israel. It's almost like a question, right? To those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. And why? Verse 3 says, For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity 
of the wicked. And Asaph is essentially living a godly life. He is committed. He's fully devoted. And, and he's uh, like you and I. He looks out there and he thinks, well, maybe if I moved out of Cheyenne and I, and I went to New York City, I could uh, do something more and I could be something more and I could make more money and I could be a bit more wealthy. And that's what Asaph is doing. And he went on to describe uh, what he was envious of. In verses 4 through 6, he noted that the wealthy had no pains in their death. Their pride was like a necklace, and they wore expensive clothes. In verses 7 through 12, describe their prideful attitudes and speech against God, noting uh, that they live in ease and, and have increased wealth. They just say whatever they want, and they, they even blaspheme the Lord. And yet, in Asaph's mind, he's like, why are they so wealthy? And by the way, I'd like to be wealthy. <laughs> God and godly Asaph went on to note that he was tempted to think being fully devoted to God was vain or worthless. This is until verse 17 when he is reminded of eternity and explains that he perceived the wealthy's end in eternal destruction. We're familiar with a few of these words and Psalm 73, but Asaph, when he took his eyes off the treasures of the world and was reminded of his wealth in heaven. He finished the psalm singing these words to the Lord, For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. He sobered back up, right? He took his eyes off the things of the world. He, 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 he realized that if I gained the whole world, but I lost my soul, what would that be worth? We might even say that the psalmist reveals that when he was tempted by the riches of this world, he had to remind himself, right, that he had made the Lord God his treasure. And whatever he had was good enough. In effect, he was fully devoted, Asaph was. He had put the kingdom first. Amen? If you're visiting uh, Capital City Church or joining us for the first time this morning, uh, you're joining us as we are preaching through the life uh, and ministry of Jesus Christ. We're on the Sermon on the Mount, and we are drawing near or at the end here of, uh, of chapter 6, if you want to move your way there, Matthew 6, as we have already started our service by reading or our worship by reading. Uh, today is part two of a short series we're calling Fully Devoted. Uh, uh, Fully Devoted. Last week we studied verses 19 through 24, and the sermon was titled Fully Devoted and kind of subtitled, Who is Your Master? And Jesus is, is, is calling us to be fully devoted, even in our finances. He called his disciples to, uh, to store up treasures, remember, in heaven and not on earth. He challenged us with two major thoughts, at least two major thoughts, I should say. If you spend any time in the Sermon on the Mount, you're challenged in many more ways than two. The first one was to look at where our treasure was stored, telling us that where, wherever it was, our hearts were there also. In other words, whatever we invest our money in is what we are actually in love with. Let me say that again. The first thing uh, that Jesus does to help us shake out, maybe like Asaph, is to say, take a look at your checkbook. Now, that's weird. I don't know because we don't have checkbooks too much anymore, but, but we have a check register, right? You can look at electronically. If you want to know what you're in love with, just go down line by line and see what all those debits are, are being charged. And, and Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So he challenges challenges the disciple to be uh, fully uh, devoted. The second thought built upon that, and Jesus clarified that we, like the psalmist, could not focus on wealth in God without stumbling. Without stumbling. Asaph stumbled, right, when he began to look at the wealth of, uh, of, the, of the nations, of those who didn't uh, who, who didn't fight back the temptation for sin and keep their words right and, and live a restrained life, right? It, uh, uh, Jesus is, is saying that we cannot focus on wealth and God without stumbling. God and money are both masters, remember, and we will hate one or we will love the other. But beloved, we learned that we cannot do both. It's impossible. You'll love one 
or you'll hate the other. And you don't have to believe me, just believe what Jesus said. That's what he said. In effect, we concluded that what Jesus had taught was that wherever our treasure is, there our master is. When you're looking at that checkbook, (laughs) you'll know who your master is. Well, being fully devoted to God with finances causes an immediate question to arise in our hearts, doesn't it? <laughs> you all feel this. I hope you do. I hope I'm not alone. And that question is, if we don't financially care for ourselves uh, and our future, who is going to? <laughs> who is going to? And so Jesus ends this first section challenging who is our master. You can't love God and money. And so our immediate thought comes, the immediate thought comes to mind is like, well, if I give that up too, it puts us right in the seat of the rich young ruler, right? If I give all that up, how will I be taken care of, right? That's what, that's what goes on uh, in our minds and hearts. To say amen or oh me. <laughs> Who said oh me? <laughs> I did, all right, right? <laughs> that's the reality of it. God calls us to this full uh, devotion, uh, even in our finances. So uh, if we don't take care of ourselves, who will? That's the, that's the question. Maybe the big idea that we need to take away is the answer to that question. Well, notice Matthew 6, 25 through, verses, uh, 25 through uh, verse 34. And verse 25 starts, for this reason. So that helps us, right? It directly ties uh, the reality that Jesus is staying in this same thought here. Uh, For this reason, what is the reason? We cannot serve God in wealth. And and what is the reason? So we can answer this question. If I don't financially take care of myself, then who will? Jesus effectively says that God is able and he will provide these things. Look at the rest of verse 25. He says, I say to you, do not be worried about your life. I'll pause here to point out that the Greek word, Uh, behind worried is a present tense active imperative verb. In other words, you hear me say this often, and I like to bring these imperative verbs out in our text because they're the verb of command. It's uh, we see it in the English, we, we, we get that, but, but I think just to pause for a moment and realize that, that uh, like us putting an exclamation point behind something, uh, that, that happens within the grammar of the Greek. Uh, of the Greek. And so, so we want to we wanna pull that out, and in, in, in there's this strong warning, right, uh, 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 with using this uh, present tense active imperative verb that commands the believer who is fully devoted to Christ not to worry about being taken care of financially. Jesus uses the word worry five times in these verses, uh, knowing why. Why? <laughs> because he knows that's what we do, right? And we know whether we want to say that we're, we have uh, maybe arrived from worrying about finances or not. The, the reality is, is, is in a world where it was very much day labor and you had to go to the market to buy whatever food you had if you made money for the day, like, there's a lot of worry there, right? <laughs> I need to make money, and I need to get to market, and I need to f- feed my family. And so, um, so this, this idea uh, of worry shows up five uh, different times uh, in the text. Five different times. Um, let's remember that fully devoted, the, the fully devoted Apostle Paul And remember what he told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 8. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. And remember that while in prison, he wrote, as we mentioned last week, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing. So we might just just, just pause and and that word anxious can certainly be translated worried. Be worried for nothing in some of your translations. It is translated that way. But be worried for nothing but everything in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehensions, will guard your heart, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen? That brings, that brings a little bit, but then you immediately go, well, how would I afford to live? <laughs> and the worry rises back up in our minds and in our hearts. And notice here what it is that a fully devoted disciple will be worried about. What you will eat or what you will drink. Right? Don't 
Don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Now, why is Jesus talking about food and clothing? You might remember that uh, he has just used two examples as treasures that people stored up for themselves on earth. Look back up to verse 19, where Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, where moth excuse me, and rust destroy. Moth is a, a mixture of moth and rust. If you, <laughs> I'm just trying to shorten the sermon up a bit. <laughs> uh, it's so fun to be me. All right. <laughs> now, it's easy to understand, right, that moths uh, destroy clothing, one of the items that Jesus, in our text, says that we should not worry about. But what about rust? Rust does not really negatively affect precious metals, what we might think of as treasures, and, and, uh, um, uh, and, and it certainly um, is... It's maybe a question that we, we, we should answer and is what is it that we should understand about rust? And I think that the greater picture in, in most of your translations there use rust. Um, uh, uh, but I alluded to this last week and, and, I, and I think it's important for us to just see the context and maybe this is a bit of your pastor just wanting you to answer questions about the text inside the text in the context. And I alluded to this last week, but the word rust is best translated as deterioration by consumption or simply consumption. And so we can see why they would want, the translators would want to use the word rust, but it's not really the word there and they don't want to use multiple words to describe a single word. And so rust seems to, to define what it means to have deterioration by consumption, right? Have you ever had anything rust? You know, your truck? your guns, I don't know, whatever it is, right? Well, the updated NIV decided to press in on this here recently, breaking with tradition, and they, ran, they rightly translated it as vermin. So it's not rust, but vermin. Uh, they, I, I think uh, they're after the right thing there. And, and what do vermin like rats, mice, grasshoppers, and others do, but they consume the food that we have, what? Stored up. Now, uh, my family and I, we live across the street from a fairly large city park, but uh, it's big enough that I guess that it must be somewhat of a home for lots of mice. Uh, and we find that out every fall around October, November, when it starts getting cold uh, at night, all of a sudden it's like, where are these mice coming from? And they, they're magic, you know, they get into all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, if we leave a bag of dog food stored up there in the garage, there'll be a little hole in it, right? And out, out of all that, uh, that little hole, all this dog food will have poured out. And, and this is the idea of vermin here. It's, it's more around the idea of vermin consume food, right? They, they, they take the things that we store up. And why am I bothering us with this? Because context is important, and Jesus is referring to what he just said in verses 19 through 24. For example, moths consume stored-up clothing, don't they? Right? You don't ever have a moth problem with the clothing you have on, right? All right, this is where you say, yes, yes, yes pastor, yeah, right? We don't have moths, right? For <laughs> It's not like, no, I get these moths off, right? But... Go to the clothing that you have stored up around September in Wyoming and find, you're going to find a few uh, moths. I don't know how they get in either, right? They just, they're just like the, the, the mice, right? So um, they come in, both the moth to come in and, and eat what you have stored up and the vermin come in to eat what we have stored up. And why would a thief who is often extremely poor, break in and steal clothing and food because those are the basic physical needs of life, aren't they? Clothing and food. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul said. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content, this food and covering. So look down to verse 32 because the Lord knows that we need these things. Uh, the thief would break in and steal. Why? Because he needs these things or she needs these things. And, and, and we might call those things needs. And, and if we look down to verse 32, uh, Jesus is going to say, your heavenly father knows you, what? Need these things. But Jesus does not only, not, uh, does not only 
uh, say not to store them up, but also not to worry about them either, right? And, and why? Look what he says there in verses, verse 25. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And really, Jesus, from this point forward in our text, is just going to give examples and then restate this. This is, this is the crux. This is the center of the text. Isn't life, isn't this life as a disciple of Christ, isn't it more, isn't it more than food and clothing? So let's tease this out just a bit, a, a bit. Beloved, this statement brings everything into view. Jesus is calling his followers to be fully devoted, more devoted to him than seeking where their next meal would come from or whether or not they were going to have enough clothes to make it through the winter. It's pretty convicting, right? You might remember with me that Jesus didn't just talk the talk, but he walk the walk. You, you might remember that, that, that a man came to Jesus and he said, oh, oh Lord, I'll, I'll follow you where, wherever you go. And, and what does he respond? What does he respond to that man? You know, foxes have holes, right? Right? And birds have nests, but the Son of Man, what? Has no place to lay his head. Jesus walked the walk. He didn't just talk the talk. Early in his ministry, Jesus is, uh, and his disciples were moving, remember? Uh, from Judea in the south into Galilee in the north. In doing so, Jesus did the unthinkable. Remember, he stopped uh, and he began to, uh, to speak to somebody who was in his enemies or where he was an enemy of the land in Samaria. And being hungry and thirsty after moving all morning long, quite a distance, we studied this a few months back, uh, Jesus stopped at an infamous well but did not have the means to draw water. Furthermore, his disciples had walked into a nearby town, remember, and they were, went in there to get some food. And we might note that here that they had enough money stored up for the trip, but they didn't have food stored up. Remember uh, that it was in the middle of the day. The day was hot, it says. It was the sixth hour noon in that, uh, in that Jewish uh, world. And a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. And Jesus, right, being thirsty, asked her for a drink. And the woman, remember, was blown away that a Jew would ever even speak, uh, one, to a Samaritan, but especially to a Samaritan uh, woman. And uh, basically, he said that if she had known that she was speaking to the one who could give her eternal life, she would not have sought physical water, but living water, remember? Water that would spring up to eternal life. Well, after a bit of discussion, we remember the woman was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, and she dropped that physical water pot, a great picture of what we're talking about. Forget the physical. And she runs back into the town, and she tells everybody that she can find that she's found eternal life, real water, right? Real, real sustenance, real important things, not water, right? Beloved, notice Jesus uh, walking the walk uh, he was walking a walk of full devotion. He was putting the kingdom first. He put the woman's eternal needs before his physical needs. And then the father fulfilled Jesus' physical needs. Uh, this is so cool, by, by uh, having the woman leave her water pot. That's kind of what we're talking about here, right? You put the first things first. Tell people about the kingdom Put that first at your job. Put that first in your life. Put that first in your, in your home. You tell people about the kingdom. Tell people about eternity. And I'll take care of these things. And what a fun picture, right? She, he doesn't have a way to draw. We look there in John 4. He has no way to get the water. He's, he's horribly thirsty, right? And she leaves the pot behind, and now he's got a way to draw water. About that time, Jesus' disciples, remember, returned with food and begging Jesus to eat. Remember John 4, 32 through, 40, through 34, it records that Jesus said to have them, uh, to, to them, excuse me, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Can we say that, beloved? Is our food, is our life, is the very water that we need when we're, 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 we're more hungry? Maybe, maybe this will be just a, a bit convicting. It certainly was of me as I was thinking my way through this text, is that so often I have an opportunity to go out and, and sit down and eat. 
Have I, have I put that waitress's uh, or waiter's needs of spiritual life before my physical? What a great opportunity to share the gospel, to, to, to share eternal life, eternal food, right? The, the food and the water of life that brings eternal life with the one who's going to bring you natural sustenance. What a great opportunity. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. That's what was fulfilling. Dear friends, the spiritual food and water, the world's needs is to hear the words of the good news to enter the kingdom of heaven. Folks need to hear that God is just. He will extend mercy to anyone who recognizes their need to to turn from sin, but by no means will he ever leave the guilty unpunished. They need to know God is just. He's like a just judge that just because you made a mistake and, and, and maybe you maimed your brother or sister or friend or somebody at work uh, and it caused much, much harm to them, uh, uh, criminal as a matter of fact, just, just because you only did it one time, that doesn't mean that 20 years later when, when you've been caught that the judge would be just and say, well, looks like you've, you've, you've lived 20 years pretty good all as well. No, a just judge says you broke the law and that's God. One sin, one sinful thought, one sinful action, all of that, God holds us to account. He is just. Folks need to hear that. Folks need to hear mankind is sinful from conception and is already, before we ever take our first breath, deserving of God's eternal punishment. Folks need to hear that Christ, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, was sinless, punished for the sins of the world, but vindicated by overcoming death in his resurrection. Folks need to hear that that unless we turn from our sin and confess with our mouths that Jesus is our new master, not ourselves, right? Not, Not our sin, not our desires, but Jesus is our master and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will in fact receive the due or the just judgment. This is what people need to hear. This is the living water. Don't just smile at the clerk and be happy and hope that they can put together that you're a Christian. There's lots of happy people out there. There's lots of smiling folks out there. They need the living water. They need the food that comes from heaven. Beloved, we have to care. We have to put the kingdom first. We must be fully Devoted. Beloved, the food and water of the eternal kingdom is helping people to answer who is God, who is man, who is Christ, and, and what is a proper response to those answers. The eternal food and water of the kingdom is simple. I used to always tell my boys this. Just memorize those four things. It's God, it's man, it's Christ, and response. God, man, Christ response. God, man, Christ response. If you're wondering what the gospel is, cover, answer those four questions with people. Who is God? Who is man? Who is Christ? What is an appropriate response? It's the gospel, amen? Seeking the kingdom first must be primary to food and clothing. That is why Jesus asked this rhetorical question. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Of course, right? The answer is of course. But we often say, what about our needs? You know, real food (laughs) and real clothing. Well, Jesus gives us two examples of why not to worry as long as we put the kingdom first. Birds are used to prove that God will feed us, and flowers are used to prove that God will clothe us. Notice verse 26 in the birds. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap. That is, they don't work the ground, right? Nor do they gather into barns. Uh, Remember the context. Jesus said not to store up food where the vermin can consume, right? Right? But look at the birds of the air. They don't do any of that. Yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. The next example is clothing found in verse 28. Jesus said, and why are you worried? There's our word again about clothing, Observe how the lilies of the field grow. In other words, the field is kind of like our bodies in this particular right metaphor. Uh, observe how the field, uh, the, the field, right? And, and observe how the lilies of the field grow. They, uh, the fields do not toil, right? They're just there. They don't work. 
They don't spin. They don't go and, and, and spend hours and hours building clothing, right? They're not making their own garments. Yet I say to you, Jesus says, that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these, and we might add, fields, right? Beloved, I tell you, I don't know, uh, last year was certainly the wettest year that we lived here in Cheyenne, and it's the wettest year that we'd been around in, in a long time, and, and, and we got quite a bit of rain, and, and yet uh, it's always, if you've ever done this, just the most wondrous thing to head up Go up to the snowy range, even up here, uh, I call it Pole Mountain. I think you, you Cheyenne, Cheyenne folks probably just call it Kurt Gowdy. I don't know. What do you call it? Kurt Gowdy or Pole Mountain? If you're from Laramie, you call it Pole Mountain. I think if you're from Cheyenne, you say Kurt Gowdy. Either way, if you went up to the mountains last year after all the rain uh, in June and in early July, you noticed what? All these wildflowers. My wife and I had a great opportunity to take about a week off. We went over to the Snowy Range and, and uh, spent some time over on the Platte River in early July. And we just, we took some rides and, 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 and we just really, really enjoyed all the, the wildflowers. So there was a, a time along this road where we stopped and there was this giant field uh, and it was just buzzing with bees and every color you could imagine. And this is what Jesus is trying to bring the imagery into our minds about being taken care of. If God will clothe the field like that, how much more would he take care of you if you fully devote yourself to him? That's the question. That's, that, that's what's being asked, right? Uh, God, God takes care of this field that is here today, and it's, it's not too far into July, and next thing you know, it's dry, and all those petals are on the ground, and then a fire comes through and just burns it up, right? If God does that, how much more would he take care of you, one who's created in his image, who is called and is fully devoted to following after him? You see, beloved, even Solomon, the man who had more wealth stored up than any person in Israel's history, could not clothe himself with the beauty of the wildflowers that we observe each and every year. And remember that after Solomon had sought all the wealth, wisdom, and sensual experiences this world had to offer, he wrote this at the end of his life in Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanities. <laughs> Have you ever studied Ecclesiastes? He's, Solomon sought every sort of pleasure on this earth, every sort of wealth that you could get from this earth. He, he stored up more than any king had ever stored up for Israel. They were stronger militarily. They, he had multiple wives. He had horses and chariots. As a matter of fact, if you, if, you re, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 18, Solomon went right down the list of what not to do as a king of Israel. Right? Don't store up for yourselves wives. How many wives did he have? Over 700. Don't multiply horses. How many horses did he have? He had three fortified cities full of chariots and horses, right? Don't store up gold for yourself. More wealthy than any man he'd ever been. And he comes to the end of his life. Ecclesiastes is kind of a, a swan song in the ending of his life, right? And, and now he's in the, the final chapter that we would call it in 12. And, and he's looking back over his life and he's like, vanity, vanity, don't do it. It's not worth it. And what is his answer? Just a few verses later in verses 13 through 14, literally the, the, the last thing that he's writing uh, to Israel, the conclusion, that is his life of luxury and all the things that he experienced. When all was, has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Now, I like to think that Solomon is going to spend eternity with us, but I like to also remind us that Jesus told his disciples when it came to wealth, many who were first, essentially, on this earth will be last in the kingdom. And I wonder where Solomon will be in all of his searching for and desiring and attaining and leading, will he be one who's sweeping the streets of gold for eternity? Or will
will we be first? I don't know. The Lord knows the heart. He judges everything. And that is his point here. Solomon, at the end of his life, pouring out the wisdom that he's gained from a life of seeking after himself, says, here, I'll keep it simple for you. Fear God (laughs) and keep his commandments. Beloved, if we can just see through the veil of this life, we will see that, as Jesus said in verse 26, we are more valuable than the birds, and God feeds the birds, right? And we'll see, uh, or, 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 or we can ask this question um, uh, or realize this, this reality in verse 27 that we cannot add a single hour to our lives through worrying. Remember the man in Luke 12 who was so worried about storing up his excess grain that his plan was to build bigger barns, yet God said to him, you fool, tonight your life is required of you. Storing up treasure on heaven or on earth, yet he didn't know that he had another day left. What's the point? Serve God, fully devote yourself, chase after the Lord. Build up treasures in heaven. Beloved, the man should have put the kingdom first and all of the food and all of the clothing that he was wanting to build bigger barns for would have been added to him. Yet he worked hard his whole life, right, for his retirement, only for those uh, uh, only for those who would follow him up, right? Somebody else to enjoy it. How many times have you known somebody? I'll just work another year. I'll just buy another company. I'll just make some more money. I'll just, I'll get a little further down the road and, and then I'll serve the Lord later. You know, I'll be, I'll be more serious about it then, right? And how many times have you seen this? And I've seen it so many times where, where somebody pushes and pushes and pushes. They finally retire and then within six months, they, they come up ill and die. It's like the man with the treasure. Let me build bigger barns. Let me store more stuff. Beloved, put the kingdom first. Amen? We don't know when our life will be required of us. Beloved, Jesus calls us to be fully devoted in our finances and to seek the kingdom first. And as we recognize the reality that Jesus is commanding us to follow him uh, with all we have, we ask the question, right? If we don't financially care for ourselves, ourselves, then who will? We come back to it. The answer is summed up in verse 30. If God so clothes the grass of the field, that is with the beauty of the flowers, right, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Jesus continues on to say, you of little faith, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing for the Gentiles eagerly seek all those things. Remember the Psalm of Asaph that we started with. He looked upon the Gentiles. He looked upon all their wealth and, and he says, I, I almost stumbled. I almost fell. I almost traded the treasures of heaven for the treasures of this earth. Beloved, our Heavenly Father knows that we need all of these things, this food, this clothing. But as verse 33 declared, there is a great promise attached to being fully devoted to Christ in our finances. What is it? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. And beloved, being fully devoted does not equal an easy Uh, carefree kind of life, does it? If you've lived with Christ long enough, you will know that it is far from easy and it's far from carefree. The idea of this promise is, is not that life is going to be easy. And this is, this is my point as a Christian. It's not, it's not name it and claim it. It's not some kind of prosperity idea that as long as you do this, then God will bless you beyond all imagination. Now, we can see things like that in the text, but then we look at the reality of Christ himself and those apostles who followed him. Uh, And we might even remember that in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus told this to his apostles who who these promises no doubt uh, applied to. You know, in the world, you have tribulation, but take courage, right? I have overcome the world. You're going to have tribulation. And the fully devoted apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, therefore I am well content. He's content with what? Weakness, with insults, 
with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. And you might remember back to chapter 11 when he went through a whole litany of how many times he had been beaten and, and left out to sea and, and, and thrown in prison over and over and over and over. And then add to that the daily pressure of all the churches and how Satan is attacking them, right? Uh, that's not comfortable. Jesus is not predicting comfort for you. These things will be added to you. Don't worry about them. You'll have what you need. Notice that the promise of contentment is difficulties for Christ's sake. That is being fully devoted in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Beloved, to seek the kingdom first is to be content like Jesus was with the Samaritan woman at the well and putting people's eternal needs before his physical needs. If we do that, the Lord will give us the food we need to sustain us and the clothing we need to protect us. And with those things, the the Apostle Paul would say, let us be content. Let us be content. Therefore, Jesus answers the question that Asaph almost stumbled over when he looked at the wealth of the ungodly. Asaph was asking, should I store up treasures like the ungodly? Or or the question that we often ask, "If, if I don't store up food and clothing, who will take care of me. But the answer is simple. And we'll finish this sermon with Jesus' word. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today and In this word, in this great reminder, Lord, that if we keep our focus and our our eyes, our attention upon your kingdom, that kingdom uh, that certainly in a in a mystical way exists uh, where you are and wherever you are, and Lord, we look forward to the day that when you are here, that that kingdom will also exist here. I pray, Lord, that we might take upon ourselves the wisdom of Solomon, who took a who, who, who so uh, ran after the things of the world but ended up saying really all that mattered was that, that we would fear you and that we would follow your commandments. I pray as a church, as a people, as individuals in here, we, we might spend time in the Spirit this week asking you to convict us of, uh, of the sinful driving after the things of the world while we watch people go by who are destined for hell and are, we are unwilling, Lord to share the gospel. Let us be a people who put the kingdom first. Help us, Lord, with our courage to do all these things. We know it takes your spirit, your guidance, your love, and the body of Christ to spur each other on. We'll be careful, Lord, to to give you all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as we finish our worship service, singing In Christ Alone. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, God flesh, fullness of God in helpless day, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin was laid 
here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground, there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost, its grip on me, for I am His, and He is mine, but with the precious blood of Christ. Great verse to end with, no guilt in life. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. What a joy it is to encourage each other with that truth through song. Let's pray.